mode. Good morning, everyone. Afternoon. Wow, it's one o'clock. Russell Wright here. Network Empire, Director's Cut, Project B. Sue Bell is here and Jimmy Kelly is here. We are really excited to see each and every one of you. The room is starting to fill up and it still feels like morning for me. I don't know why. Maybe it was because I had a late night. I'd agree with you there, Russ. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's really good to see some of the familiar names in here. And you can see that we have the questions that have been flowing in still. And can I just get a one from everybody if you can hear me? And you should have heard Jimmy. Give me a one if you can hear us. Let's do a technology check. Check, check, one, two. Hi, Paula. Hi, David. Jim is here. More people coming in. Excellent. Christina Crowley is here. Fantastic. Carol Harkins is here. It's good to see you, Carol. Paul, it's four, it's four o'clock where Carol is. Okay. Does it feel like morning or evening to you, Carol? <laughs> really good to see all of you. Okay. So we have about a little over half of the attendance list has shown up. So we'll probably get people in over the next few minutes. And for those of you who have, may have not been on this before, uh, we answer the questions first that have come in through our question survey form. And then we also will use the back, the overflow, which you can be typing into your questions box. And I try to keep that uh, available and um, let Jimmy and Sue know. And I answer any of the ones that I can answer. So be patient with us. We have a lot of things to cover and we should probably get rolling. Should we just start at number one, Jimmy? Or Yeah, I guess we'll just start at number one. Okay. So this one's from Patrick. Um, so if I post the description as text in the blog. Last week's movie, so maybe. Yeah, I'm not following that one. Can you elaborate on that a little bit, Patrick? Yeah. Let's see if Patrick. Oh, that's Patrick Mominy. Okay. Go ahead and try to rephrase that. We're not quite getting that one, Patrick. Let's just move on to the next one. Oh, no, he, oh, there it goes. Yeah, I think he'll. It's okay. probably. No time. Melanie. Hi, guys. How am I able to get my RSS from a video on my YouTube channel? Is it in the DC course? Thanks so much. You know, I don't remember. Did we put that one in there, Russ? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we gave it to him in that course, but I'll go a whole, there's been a, Cup or, I believe there was a minor change to the YouTube RSS feed. Any of you guys know about that? But I do have it in the glossary. Let me just uh, pull that up for you guys and gals. We have a little cheat sheet with all the RSS feeds. And if for some reason that RSS feed is not on the cheat, cheat sheet, I will add it. We have an RSS feed list. And so I'll drop that in to the... Uh, area here. It's called the RSS feeds quick sheet and it's got the YouTube RSS. Let me just confirm that that YouTube RSS is working properly. And YouTube RSS should be the, yeah, it seems to be. Okay. I'll go ahead and drop this in. Does everybody know how to access the uh, group chat room? I'll go ahead and send that to the entire audience and I'll do a double confirm that that RSS feed is still working. It should be the gdata.youtube feed. And also I give you a few tips on that glossary uh, entry on the different RSS feeds. I believe they're still all working, but in the event that they're not, I will fix it. Yeah. Oh, you better. Yeah, I will. I'll be, I'm on it. I think this, I think this next question is for you too, Russ. <laughs> oh no. You guys aren't giving me any break. I just barely had my first cup of coffee. Yeah. The, <laughs> <laughs> the author tube is, I'm just confirming these feeds. Hang on for a second, you guys. Confirming they're still working. Yeah. It's okay. For those of you who are not in the director's cut NE hybrid Skype chat, these are the kinds of things also, if there's a broken feed or something like that, that you notice, I usually grab those out of there and put them on the glossary. It looks like we're okay on this one though. Okay. 
What's the next one? Let me just check that. Where is Jimmy? This is back to Russell. Is this Josh Fletcher? Because if it's Josh Fletcher, I'm not going to answer it. He's just messing with me. <laughs> oh, Josh Ferris. <laughs> Sorry. There's two Josh, <laughs> Joshua Fs. <laughs> It's very was, confusing. I've, I've started grouping people by location. There's a lot of people. It's interesting, Joshua, that I said that because the question kind of made sense because Fletch is, he actually is a pay for performance company because he does local paper call and he's pretty good at it. So he, he actually delivers on his paper performance. You pay for the calls that come in. So that's a model where, you know, He's actually doing that. So I thought he was messing with me when I was reading this. <laughs> so he says, back, this is back to Russell's point. I can understand not being pay for, pay for performance, but isn't that idea of being a good SEO versus a bad spammy SEO who doesn't know what they're doing? Or is it the onus of the business owner to gamble either way according to the budget? Uh, well, let's just take a look at that. Let's just break down the question. Uh, and let me be cautious with the question. Uh, <laughs> whether somebody is or is not on pay for performance has nothing to do really, in my opinion, with what kind of SEO they use to get the work done. Uh, to me, I hold them in two separate categories. You can have SEOs that get you sustainable rankings, and then there's SEOs who get you non-sustainable rankings. For example, <laughs> I was looking, I didn't get to show Jimmy this, but there's this company out there called SEO Pay, Pay SEO or something like that. And they get you marginal rankings every time, and then you just pay $300 like when you get the rankings. It's like they don't, you don't ever talk to a person. You don't do anything. It's just you only pay if they get you the results that you're wanting to. Okay, and then, you know, basically. And <laughs> That's there's a, what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, I mean, it, there's no human being. There's no, it's, it's completely the Jeff Bezos model, you know, of the best kind of help support is no help support. You know, <laughs> um, it's just, you know, what I find interesting about it is the, the methods. If you were to look at the different methods used by these kinds of companies, you're going to find a wide variety. And I know of other services out there that are pay for performance that use, you know, SAP links and all kinds of different things out there. So for me, I'm trying not to distinguish the business model from the quality of the SEO because they don't have to be the same thing. And that's the main thing that I'm pointing out is that I wasn't really trying to say that you couldn't uh, pay, you know, get paid on performance. I would just caution people who really suck at SEO to get paid on performance. That's all that I was really saying. And I, I hope that just is common sense. Like, you, you know, it, do, it does push you to be a better SEO if you say, hey, I will get you the next, you know, I will get you this ranking and this ranking, you know, and you've been in business as an SEO uh, following a paint by number system and hoping that it's going to get your rank, your client ranked. I just, you know, I think that's great. It'll push you to be a better SEO. I'm just saying that's not the only model that's out there, you know, and you might want to consider the other models before you just schlep SEO and, and without a lot of experience of successfully executing. And I'm yeah, sure Jimmy it, could add to that. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it depends how they couch the SEO. Yeah. Like I've seen, you know, I met a guy once that, you know, he put SEO in his services for the client and the client didn't really know what SEO was or did for him, and I doubt he ever saw any improvement, but that SEO's opinion of doing SEO was just doing on-page optimization, which he did poorly, by the way, but, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, to him, he was getting paid an extra amount each month in, in conjunction with keeping the website up and, and up to date, so, you know, I don't know, it just kind of depends on... That, exactly. Know, how they position. Right. You know, it, it's really about your product array. And I just want to, my, my main focus is to expand your horizons on what's possible and what you get paid for. Diversifying your portfolio is not a bad idea. You'd be surprised how many things there are that make a lot of money that you don't have to hold yourself accountable for that make decent money and it all starts to add up. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be held accountable for your results. You have to be. That's the nature of quid pro quo. I'm just saying that there are also things that you would be surprised that clients would love to also have you do that don't put you at the kind of risk. The upside exposure is not the same. So that's really what I was saying. Consider all the options. Like we have some of our students sell reports up front before they do SEO. We have some people that do SEO first and they give a free report, right? You know, so those are just types of things that you might want to look at. Doing a free report is great. And 
what if you could also get paid for the report and the SEO or part of the report or you give a piece of it away? So everybody's business model is a little bit different. And, uh, you know, my thoughts on that are just consider the possibilities of how to make money by working less. I mean, that makes sense to everybody, right? Give me one if that makes sense. Like if you can make money, making your clients happy and doing less work, doesn't that make sense? Okay. I'm not saying that you should not be accountable for SEO. <laughs> I'm not saying that. Okay. Yes, never make commitments that I never would make a commitment that you can't keep. It's just, yeah. not, it's just yeah. no good. Not all of you can be Jimmy Kelly just yet when it comes to ranking accountability. <laughs> so so this one, so this next one I can answer uh, from Josh again. Said I've seen people powering up feed burner URLs. You guys train on that or have 30 second uh, overview of how to power them up effectively. So. You know, feed feed burner is a great platform. You know, it's got fairly high DA. We got bust out the trusty red arrow here. Yay! Okay, you're dealing with a 97 DA here, but you want to be cautious with the types of links that you're sending over to this because you also have. Let's see if these are. You also have these that are going directly to your money site, so you want to be just a little bit cautious because. You know, if you go out and all out spam this to hell and back, um, it's going to really lower your trust flow that you're getting from FeedBurner originally. So, you know, you might do some light other high DA authority going to this, but you don't need to go nuts. Like, I wouldn't bomb this. And only because this is the difference between, um, you know, if you if you guys have taken the one feed to rule them all, um, this is the difference between a generator and a and a aggregator. So a generator typically is what I'm, what you're looking for is something that will give you a different unique URL, but you also got to be cautious if you're not putting any other buffers in between your money site and the and your money site, then these links are going directly back to um, you know your money site directly. So just keep in mind that this is still just one hop away from your site. So you want to be cautious not to destroy the trust and you also want to be cautious not to get too heavy on your keyword anchors going to this because you know each of these pages are, are pulling your titles, which usually if you've optimized them right are, are pretty um, you know keyword oriented. So just something to be cautious of when you're looking at powering up your feed burner. Um, let's go on to the next one from Patrick. Can I silo a site after it's already been made live? Um, yeah, you can. Um, you just have to be, you know, it kind of depends on if you sent links and things to it already. Um, if you've done that, but you want to kind of rework your silo, what I try to do is go in and you're, you'll probably have to do some 301s and stuff to repopulate the silo, depending on if you're rewriting the URL structure and everything. But um, that would be the only biggest pain in the butt. Usually I don't care if uh, I'll just move them around uh, when it's done if I just am trying to reorganize a silo personally. So um, so I guess that's the best way to answer that. Good. Uh, number seven, you say reciprocal links are bad and should be avoided. Does that mean you shouldn't link to your Facebook Twitter account on your money site since they don't link back to your money site? So. It's not that they're bad, right? But they kill link juice. So, can I get a drawing up in here? Hold on a second. I'm having to get out all these programs. <laughs> these <up. laughs> Laser pointers. Can't live without them. Okay, so let's say you have, let's say you have site A, right? And then you're looking over at site B. And you know, this is this is like link uh, what do they call it, like link exchange programs or whatever like that. I don't remember what they what they used to call them. I haven't seen people do them in a long time. So each site's gonna link to each other. 
basically what that does to your juice is just nothing. So any benefit that either one would get would just be gone. And if they think that you're buying links, they'll if somebody does it through manual reports or enough, then they can get penalized. So in your instance where you're asking about your social platform, so you uh, comment specifically on Twitter or Facebook, that's technically a no-fall link back. And also, you know, with all the major social platforms, you're not really because you have a no follow going back to the site, it's not really going to make any difference for, you know, you're not trying to manipulate your juice. But also, like, every website on the web out there has a, you know, a core social presence that's that's going on for their fan base. So I wouldn't worry so much when you're dealing with Facebook and Twitter and Google Plus and LinkedIn and, you know, any other YouTube, any of the other major ones that you're looking at. Uh, not to worry that that they're going back and forth between them, but I do want to be cautious of that if it's like website to website. And that's where I would start being a little more cautious on that. So, Great. Thomas, do unused social explosion credits roll over to following month? I thought my site would be completed when I started my SE subscription, but still a work in progress. Laugh out loud. Um, do you know the answer yes, to that, Russ? Oh, they do. Sue. Okay. <laughs> I just learned that uh, last week. Just kidding. <laughs> That's because we changed it last week. No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> yes, they roll over. Yeah. Excellent. And these are all just really quick, huh? Is there any disadvantage right. to starting an affiliate site with paid traffic? Google AdWords in order to get instant traffic and then slowly build up the organic ranking to replace or supplement the AdWords. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I've I've done that in the past for clients. You know, there's been some some niches where it's a new idea. You, you know, so once or twice it's like a real new idea and there's not really any keyword volume on it as much, at least not enough to tell if there's a market for it. And in those cases, I recommend to the client that we just need to run an AdWords campaign to see if there's even any interest in what they're trying to do. Yeah. Because um, the last thing I want to do is say, let's go do rankings, and then, you know, the keywords show nothing in value by the time you're done, because then everybody's left holding an empty bag. So, you know, it's always good just to just to get that traffic going. You know, this that's the great thing about using the social platforms and all that kind of stuff too is just getting that traffic into the site because you know just getting a real fan base down into it I mean you're gonna start turning over sales if they're if they're interested in the same kind of thing that your site's about um, and it's just gonna overall strengthen your strengthen the love to your site from Google so yeah. I would say it's an advantage uh, when you're looking into that yeah we used to call this paper research I think we still do <laughs> PPR something we talked about a few years back. And one thing I would caution is just make sure that the thing that bothers me a little bit is you're talking about, I just want to look at the question behind the question for a second, is that just make sure that you understand what you're doing with pay-per-click. Because uh, I have I have watched friends and people that I know and not really clients because I don't really let them do that, uh, you know, blow lots of money without because they don't really know what they're doing. So just remember that pay-per-click is has the same level of sophistication and requirements to control those numbers and watch what's happening as anything else out there. It's technical and you should get trained on how to do it. So also when your your numbers are different when you're doing an affiliate program, make sure that you follow the rules that we talk about a lot in our uh, certification level one, which is how much are you getting paid, how many visitors and what does your conversion rate need to be before you just start dumping money. Because I would hate to see some of you guys or gals putting a you know, a bunch of pay-per-click costs on your credit cards uh, without uh, getting any results from that, just to find out that you've not optimized the page properly. And it had nothing to do with whether the market wanted it or not. It's just that you weren't communicating your message very well. Does that make sense? Give me one if that makes sense. So, you know, you, it's all about that quality score. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's quality score. Yeah, it's quality score. And it's also, you know, you can still mismatch the message to the wrong market, even though the quality score is high. I mean, the themes can be 
created. I'm just saying that you know your con your con the conversion of your page is still very very important. I mean everything Jimmy has said with the SEO is 100% accurate. I just had you know I've seen ex I've had students that have had to walk home with their head down and talk to their wife about why there's two thousand dollars on their credit card for a pay per click campaign and nothing to show for it. Just want to make sure that doesn't happen to you guys. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> Put the cone of shame on them. <laughs> <laughs> the cone of shame. The cone. Yeah, use somebody else's. Uh, you know, make sure your client is is doing the testing, and then make sure that you keep as much of that money for them as you can. Test those conversions. Cool. Where are okay, we so on this one uh, from June, I think is how I pronounce the name, mm -hmm. or Jun. Sorry if I'm butchering the name. Um, how can Pinvid sites get so much search traffic if they have duplicate content? It must be missing something. Can you guys explain the concept a little bit? So it's kind of interesting. I guess I can, you know, see so you have a site and these Pinvids mostly, they go out and they, you know, they're, they're embedding the YouTube videos from all over the place, right? So YouTube is in the business of wanting people to share Though they want people to embed those YouTube videos, right? Mm -hmm. So, why do people? Why does YouTube want that to happen? Why? Why do they want you to embed videos? Does anybody know? Type it in. Go do ahead and just do a best guess. It's okay to be wrong. <laughs> yeah. What's the real purpose of? Yeah, Carol nailed it. Yeah, and video it, ads, right? Yeah. So the more people that can take these videos and put them up on their websites, that usually will equate to targeted niche traffic for that specific video. And then what can they do then is just flip their ads right on that page. So let's say you have a popular page that goes viral online. They happen to embed somebody's YouTube video. Wow, that's a great uh, advertising space for them all of a sudden. Yep. So, you know... YouTube's encouraged to do um, these types of embeds, and embeds I don't think count as duplicate content. I'm not sure how Google considers it in contextual format when you're doing uh, iframe type stuff, but the embed certainly won't penalize you for dupe content. So with that, you kind of have another twist of things going on. Uh, so let's say you picked a keyword and you don't know really what video uh, it came in as. So let's say the original video was uh, hair salons. Okay, so that's the video that was there. But when when we optimized it or whatever, um, it's going to be a little bit easier keyword, right? So it might be a, a location, a descriptor-based keyword. So you might have like... Uh, Boston hair salon experts or something like that, right? So mm -hmm. it's still the same video all about hair salons, but when it's getting pulled into uh, the pin vid, you, you can see that you're going to have a, a smaller type keyword just based off of maybe what you pick for that silo or whatever the case might be. So as soon as you start putting in uh, social signals and everything going in, these things just start ranking because these are a lot, you know, with more small keywords, it's kind of like throwing a net out there into Google and then it collects every all the little keywords that actually generates the real traffic because over time these, these um, lower hanging fruit, they're still very relevant to what... Uh, what the main video was about anyway will start to rank. So hopefully that yeah. answers the question. It's also a lot of weird tail keyword traffic. We invented a new term from long tail, weird tail. <laughs> People are there to be entertained. Um, you, some of the keyword lists are kind of freaky, you know, and usually they're at least in the parameter of what the topic's about, which is why you want to keep your, your stuff on theme, your topic on theme. But you get long tails and weird tails and obscure traffic from different videos. You'll like, sometimes you'll see, if I go to my analytics, I'll see this pop like on one day, like thousands of visitors to a specific poster page. And, you know, there would, there would, I would be lying if I told you that you could predict the amount of weird traffic and videos and things that are going to happen when they happen. That's part of it. It's sometimes you just got to cast this massive nest, uh, net out there, like Jimmy was just saying, 
and what you pull in sometimes is unexpected and it's as unexpected as the videos that are out there and that's what that's really what an entertainment that's what that's really what engagement rank is all about this new entertainment based economy that we're in where you know even people that are doing these big budget commercials big corporations that are creating these big budget super bowl commercials even they know i mean it's becoming more and more that everybody takes that approach to the super bowl mentality if you can't keep your audience entertained then they're not going to stay with you and now the art form is to create to keep your audience entertained and make sure that they actually know what you're selling and who you are because i'm sure you guys are familiar with the super bowl like sometimes you don't even remember what the product service is so we're in this really strange time where there's this entertainment based thing so you get a lot of weird traffic from all these things as long as you keep what you're selling and your your banners and congruent with the state of mind at least partially and you may not always get it right you know you'll see you can't predict all the traffic that'll come from that stuff but it's still traffic traffic is all that matters because <laughs> quite literally i mean that's why we do seo right if you right. get to closer to top of page one then you get the rankings same concept you, you get traffic from ppc mm -hmm. from social promotions i mean it's all about trying to get those conversions onto your sites so. absolutely and melvin is saying here that uh Increased time usage, you know, time on site is a is a factor as well. So that's very very true. Yeah, absolutely. So this is another one. What should we do to protect our money sites from negative SEO? So, in a nutshell, basically you got to monitor your links and you got to check your content. Um, those are the primary prime primary things you want to look for, because. Um, that and probably your site getting hacked. Those are probably the three most common, but typically I don't think you'll get your site hacked unless it's you're going into some competitive niches. So monitoring your black your backlinks, um, you know, just keep an eye on any spikes coming in. And I usually use Copyscape or something like that to uh, double check, make sure somebody's not scraping the content and deliberately posting it all over high DA sites. Uh, for me. Um, so those are the two main things that I do just to keep an eye on it. Um, you know, there's yeah. other things, but that gets a lot more technical. So those are the two main things you probably want to do. Excellent. And uh, Sorry negative, about that, I had a cough. That's okay. Um, <laughs> negative SEO. Those of you who are familiar with the Network Empire uh, curriculum, the Traffic Hospital course and training is that's beyond the scope of what we cover in the Director's Cut. But I have to say that um, I've been through a lot of online boot camps, and the boot camp that Jimmy dragged me through on that one, I actually took it as well. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> there is at least I don't know. It's like at least 15 hours of content. Yeah, but it's 15 hours of the richest, most like you could go to a technical training with like Microsoft and not get this kind of training. So I'm really touting that course because it really is surprisingly powerful. And mostly I like the results, you know, Mike talks about earnings reports. I mean, the thing is that the first time you go and you talk to a client and you've helped them just get their site back or at least recover if it's possible. And Jimmy teaches you all that stuff. You know, you realize that you've really helped somebody, you know, and they're tossing you quite a bit of money to do that. And once you spend the time, it's just, you know, some of the best time that I've ever spent in terms of technical training for SEO. So I just want to put that out there. The other thing for that is the amount of reviews. I mean, these well, members probably don't get to see the, re no, the crazy. comments in the Skype group, but there's literally hundreds of site recoveries. Yeah, it is by far. The, happened, so. It is true. It is by it's the, you know, marketer's dream in terms of testimonials. Like I don't, I don't even have them all posted anymore. There's no room, but it is really, uh, that's one of the surprising courses that we did last year. Okay. Oh, by the way, that is very, it is very technical. So if you're, you know, you don't like technical stuff, probably it's not for you. But if you want to open that branch of your SEO division and really get into recovery, it's probably the best in the world for that. So this one's from Octavio. I'm sure. having problems indexing some of my web 2.0s for DAS clusters. I'm doing 500 words unique articles about page, contact page, and social signals via one feed supercharger and social explosion. Any special sauce 
you guys could help could share to help with the indexing. It's been over 40 days for some of the properties and still no success. So I don't know how many articles you put into your 2.0, but you know sometimes if you can just go in and get at least five pages of content on because some of those 2.0s are stubborn to index. It just kind of depends on the properties you pick. But um, you know, I'll, I'll I'll get like five supporting pages for that web 2.0 and interlink them. By interlinking, I I mean make sure this one links to these, this one links to these. Does that make sense with interlinking? So you're going to link to the other pages within each page of the site. It helps uh, even out that juice flow through the 2.0. The other thing you can do is besides just doing articles is making sure you're putting rich content on there. So you want to put stuff like a video on there um, that usually will help. Uh, you know, just putting a YouTube video up on there. Pictures can help too if you route them through Picasa and put them up onto your web 2.0. Things where you're alerting Google, a Google platform that, hey, uh, we have some of your content over here. It usually helps out a lot. So, and if those things still make it slow for me, then I just go throw some of them through indexification. Typically, is is what I'll do for last case. But I usually don't have to go that far unless I've done ridiculously spun content. So, <laughs> define ridiculously spun. <laughs> <laughs> And what tools That's are you using? <laughs> complete garbage content on it. <laughs> oh, you mean like Markov generator? <laughs> we'll call it the Jimmy so, Jimmy Markov generator. So hopefully that'll help. Those are probably the three things I'd recommend. So cool. Um, so more content on the 2.0. Put videos into that content, and if all else fails, then you know indexification. Hmm, okay. So. I am new, and if I understand, uh, this is from Andres. I am new, and if I understand correctly, I can use Video Kraken for my PBNs along with Social Explosion. The static homepage will have the videos and content with links to the money site. All future posts of the PBNs will only contain articles but not videos from Video Kraken, and, and they will be placed in order below the static homepage, correct? I also only use the vSilo plugin for my money site. Huh, okay. PBNs are just posts. That was a question. PBNs are just posts? Yeah, I mean, it's not going to make any difference juice-wise if it's coming off a post that you're running through your homepage or a page from your homepage, if that makes sense. Like, there's no difference in juice flow between the two. It, like, it's going to, it has the same metrics no matter where it's coming from. Um, so I wouldn't worry about if it's, does it have to be a post, does it have to be a page? Um, certainly pages will help a little more in the SERPs, but as far as passing your link juice, uh, in my opinion, it doesn't matter if if it's a page or a post. Oh, okay. Um, Good. So unless you're trying to actually rank that PBN, then you can settle for a post, basically is what that means. Uh, so everything else I think is fine there with with this question. Do you think I'm missing anything on that? No, that's good. I wanted to clarify because some questions came through. Indexification is not a word that Jimmy made up. It's actually a product. It's a backlink. There's a few people that think you just made up a word. It's actually a service that you can use that does mass spidering backlinks. You can get things crawled. So that's the one. That's the indexing service that Jimmy uses. Does everybody get that? Just give me one because there was some confusion there. It's actually a service. You got that? Okay. And I would pay close attention to the services that Jimmy chooses to use. I've tried a lot of them. He's tried a lot of them. I know Sue has as well. That's the one that he's currently recommending. Okay. So, yeah, and there's just some that work better than others. And you also got to be careful. You know, you don't have to just go with indexification. I mean, there's a lot of them out there. But you just want to be, you just want to kind of look and see how they do their indexing. You know, you don't want, mass links going to like a tier one link or something like that. So, yeah, you know, just kind of just read through their services. If it looks like they're using most mostly social and, you know, high DA stuff in front, you're, you're going to be a lot better off than 
something that's mass nonsense to it. Nice. To links. So remember, you don't want to kill your trust flow. So I was standing out in the front of Weebly yesterday, Jimmy, thinking about you in downtown Scottsdale here. No, I, was yeah. think, and I was thinking about walking in and asking them if they could provide this group with high DA pages. I was just. <laughs> Can we have an unlimited account? Can we have unlimited? Want? Yeah, just a single account. <laughs> I was going to explain my situation, you know, let them know that we needed to jack all their authority for this group. But you know, <laughs> I didn't quite know how to negotiate the deal. You know, it never hurts the <laughs> <answer. laughs> Worst they could say is no. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> they look at me very funny. They go like, what is SEO? Unique images, what is the impact they really have on your rankings? Or I can rank with images that I got from somewhere else just as easy. Um, I've, you know, personally, I've never really tested unique images. Um, I haven't really worried about much. I mean, the only thing I care about unique with is I'm not infringing on copyright stuff because it's nothing worse than getting a letter in the mail saying you owe $7,800 because you scraped some dude's picture. <laughs> Oh, right. Wow. <laughs> you know, I've gotten that a few times. Um, but <laughs> I'm sure you have. <laughs> usually they're just uh, they're just trying to get money out of you. So you just pony up and say, okay, let's go to court, and then they usually back down. But mm -hmm. anyways, <laughs> um, I got that was a squirrel. We got sidetracked on that. That's all right. It is actually um, big, it is actually a sidetrack. There is a big business, big business, and just parsing all the you know and looking for those. So, and yeah, you can rank with images that you got from somewhere else. I, I don't think that a unique image makes that much of a difference, but again, I haven't tested it. So, you know, go out and test it. And let us know what you find out because it could be something in there. could make a little bit of a difference. So. Indeed. Um, David Hood. Link juice and trust flow aside, what do we know about what Google looks at and uses to make ranking decisions with regards to social signals? How much of what is going on on social sites can they really see? Well, I mean, the social sites already meet the DA, so the authority of those properties linking into your site, so that covers that. Aside from that, I would say you're probably looking at uh, a combination of your traffic and bounce rate. Um, and I would say that those are the other main decisions that you'd probably be looking for. So, because aside from that, I can't really see anything else they'd be measuring. So, let's see. There might be there might be some advantages if they're part of the Google. Oh yeah, Cartel. the hub partners. Yeah, if they're part of the hub partners, there may be. I don't think Jimmy has ever. Come out and said that there's a that he's been able to measure a distinct difference with that, but it does make you wonder. I mean, there's some hub partners. You know, it makes you wonder if the hub partners might have some kind of clout or some kind of authority predominance, but we don't really know for sure. And it's okay to not know. It's okay. <laughs> not knowing it's okay. So many hours. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is interesting. Like Cora was a part of the Google Hub Partners system for a while. And then they actually got out of it because they felt like Google was <laughs> not, there wasn't any advantage in it for them. And I don't know all the politics there, and I've always wanted to know what actually happened there, you know, why they got out of that. But it's kind it's of interesting. interesting to be a fly on the wall. Yeah, I'll, I'm still researching that. But So this one's from Carl. Hey, last week I had this question. After having about 40 plus plus auto posts with back, backlinks form, from each of my social profiles. I'm starting to ask myself, do the first links from my social sites to my money sites posts I made still count and give backlink power? Because in some social profiles, you have to scroll all the way down and it's a long, always loading a new page. I also have social sites that don't do auto blogging, but you have to scroll. So does Google still count the links that are way at the bottom of the page? So you have to scroll. Um, if it's all found on the same page, then I, I would say probably anything after 100 is is mute. I, I don't think you want to go that far into it or, or really count any juice beyond that. As far as like a site-wide link, so if your destination URL is the same, 
I know that they usually will take your first five strongest links from that domain and count it towards your rankings. However, with your anchor text percentage, all of that counts. So you get juice from five strongest pages, but you only get, but you also have to take into account that all of those are going to be anchor text going in if it's going to the same place. Now, if they're all going to different places, then, you know, you should be fine, but, you know, again, you also want to keep in mind that you want diversification of IPs as well. So, you know, just keep mixing in other signals into there, not signals, I should say, mm -hmm. other backlinking type sites to try and get as much diversity as you can. Gotcha. So, but hopefully, I don't know if that answers that question, but. I think so. Carl, did that cover that for you? I'm not sure if Carl is here today. It's okay. I'll watch okay. the replay. All right. Here's Leo. Oh, this one's for you, Russ. Okay. Uh, what type of topics, uh, what types of, oh, types of content that you put into RSS directories get picked up more often than others by people who look? That's a great question. Um, there's a couple of things. Uh, that's a really big question that can't really be answered. Um, but I can get, I can narrow it down. Think about the services that are out there and then think about people like me who like take tons of feeds and regurgitate it for content, right? That's one of my methods. And also take it, take for example, the stuff that we teach in level four certification of the network empire certification process. Uh, you know, the way that we deal with feeds is, is many. Uh, so for example, feeds that have video on them, when you have video services or video technologies, walk backwards from the technologies. Uh, you know, like there's a developer that I know pretty well who's, you know, developed a technology that all he does is hold the data for feeds that people are then borrowing from sites and then putting them onto other sites. I think feedsapi.com is Charlie's company. Uh, so these are the things that like all that he does is like try to keep the servers up because people are jacking so much content and spitting it back out to the networks that it's a full-time like industry. So when you ask that question, a better question might be, uh, what are you in an industry that is technical enough for people to understand that they can borrow and or republish your content via RSS feeds? So that is a pretty good uh, question, Leo. It might be, for example, if you're in the SEO industry, do you think people are technical enough to know that they can jack content via RSS feeds? either via full text, partial text, and or just simple links? Yeah, the answer would be yes. Uh, what, so one question you might ask, and I, I think this probably coincides to Jimmy, like the SEO field, like we know as SEOs that there are some niches and markets that are super non-technical and the likelihood of being negative SEO is far less, right? Because, you know, like for example, knitting, probably isn't going to have a huge amount of negative SEO out there unless it's a gazillion dollar industry and they pulled in some really big SEOs, you know, like home knitting, something like that. I don't know. That can be pretty. <laughs> <laughs> nah, -uh. underwater basket. Stop <laughs> it. It's kind of you look bad. You can no, I mean, ladies <laughs> with these, these really heavy SEO techniques. That's not pretty. You took my water basket weaving keyword. I will destroy you. Oh my, I'm, they're, calling, they're calling the Russians. Watch out. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, hopefully it makes a little bit of sense. I have noticed this. There, there are some industries that are just less technically savvy. And it's something that I know it seems really obvious, but it's something that you don't necessarily take into account all the time, or at least not in the early years of, you know, online development. And then it becomes really, really obvious that when you're in fields that are maybe uh, not really exploited by SEO or by, you know, they haven't been pitched or called and marketed to by a lot of SEO hacks and tricks, and which generally means there's not tons of money in that market in terms of, uh, it's not a regulated market like Viagra or pharmaceuticals or casino or adult. Um, the likely, the less, the further away you get from that central, like big, big dollar addicted market type of things with high recurring and high ticket items, and or addicted ticket items, the further away you get from that, the more likely you are uh, that the stuff is probably not going to be jacked, borrowed, or, or services like feed, feedsapi.com and the rest won't be having to, you know, work with those types of things. Does that make sense, Leo? I hope that answers the question. You know, I, I kind of think that maybe he was asking the question from a different direction. 
In other words, I think that he actually wants his content to get picked up. I'm sure he does, and I just told him that now my answer stands with what he just asked. For instance, okay. for instance, if you, if I can't change the market that he's in, he might be in a market where his content won't get stolen. It's quite possible. That's my point. But but there are ways that you can rethink your market. For example, my dumpster client. I mean, there's just no really juicy content that you can put out there about dumpsters. But you can rethink it so that you've got like all of the things that you can use dumpsters for. And those can be passionate concepts, like home remodeling. If he submits in it into, as long as he doesn't take his RSS feed and put it into a non-thematically rated RSS directory, because then the RSS directory will kick him out. So he wants to be, as long as, Sue is exactly correct, if you want to reposition your feed, let's say you're in the dumpster market, and the dumpster market is, you know, you know, we talked about this actually building a PINVID site for home remodeling, right, for your dumpster guy. Um, you know, if you find that there's a market that uses dumpsters, I guess my question to you, Sue, would be, you know, when I take a, 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 a dumpster RSS feed that talks about the latest and greatest dumpsters, or whatever it is he's got on the site and thread that through an RSS directory under the topic that is home remodeling, how is the directory owner going to feel about that? Is that a no, problem? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually do that. I'd actually change the content on the blog to be about remodeling because there's only so many articles that you can write about dumpsters, right? Oh, that's true. Yeah. Well, you're so, talking, so yeah, you're definitely blog. talking about an entirely different concept than I was approaching yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I said you're I talking about new content. Like you're talking about creating an entirely different content. Mm -hmm. okay. Related content that's, that's um, tangentially related, but the people who are going to be interested in that are also interested in your product. Mm -hmm. Do you think there would be a relationship between co-occurrence in Kraken and TOKT on what is appropriate for people to write about? Sure, absolutely. That's interesting. So I could find a co-occurrence, say, of something that was within a percentage range of what I'm talking about, create a new blog category and pull that RSS feed, and it has more likelihood of getting stolen is what you're saying. Exactly. Okay. I, I agree. That's a great idea. Next question. Most excellent. All right. Um, hey, last week I asked you guys about ghostery, which hides the tracking cookies. Did you look into that? Um, I did not. Did you, Sue? I know that was on the notes to do. Oh, uh, yes. Here's the status of that, Leo. <laughs> um, thank you for following up on that. Uh, I'm looking, I'm testing the, the ghostry along with a couple of other things to see if it is covering my tracks, but I wasn't prepared. I didn't finish my homework, so sorry. I will try to have that next week. I actually do have it installed. I just haven't tested the tracking. I've got it installed with another app, and uh, I'm going to, uh, Lightbeam actually, I'm testing it against Lightbeam to see if it covers my tracks. And uh, Sue's been, Sue and Jimmy are way too, have been way too busy to get into that, so I'll try to report next week to you. Next question. Okay. Uh, let's see. Hey, folks, does a 301 from expired domain to social link, social profile like Twitter, Facebook about me work, and does that create a footprint? Um, I suppose... Well, I don't know. That's that's kind of technical. <laughs> Do we want to go over that or no? Nah. Okay. I, I think um, that there's just too much chance for beginners to get burned with those um, kinds of topics. Andre, I like the way you're thinking. Come to live certification. <laughs> okay. So this one's from Theo. Question one. How would you go about tackling an abusive YouTube video attacking an authority figure in a particular niche? His video has the site name and name of the person in the description of the video made by an annoyed crazy person. <laughs> Not optimized, no backlinks, but his ranking on first page Google. The authority figure in question has his own video YouTube channel with many videos not optimized for any keywords. What is the best strategy to knock out the bad video or can we report this to Google slash YouTube? All the authority figure has done is left his opinion on a subject with full disclaimers. 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> I guess there's a few different things that you can do. So, like, you can use DMCA in some instances to get content taken down, especially if they're infringing on any type of, um, you know, so if they're using your name, for instance, or if they're using a particular business that they don't have rights to do, you can go after them that way. You can also get an attorney to threaten them to take it down. Um, last resort would be to negative SEO that YouTube video. No, that's not a resort. <laughs> <laughs> that would be my last resort, but... <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy. No, that is not your last resort either. Okay, so one thing I would say is that you're getting into uh, PR. I'm just messing with you, Jimmy. Um, you, this is definitely public relations and PR. And let me just try something here, which I know is going to sound really weird. It's really part of something called reputation management. Uh, and reputation management has a few different kinds of things that you can do. One thing I would like to suggest is if it's affected rankings in any position, what you want to do is you want to get your clients' sites on the keywords and topics that matter ranked and create what we call a roadblock. Both Jimmy and Sue are prolific at creating those types of things, which means that you hit the first page and all that's there is you all the way down, right? So that's one helpful way. But that actually doesn't really deal with the issues in the industry. Uh, anybody, when they start to become an authority figure or start to put themselves out there, uh, depending upon how they're doing it and depending upon what how their integrity is, will put them open themselves up to public scrutiny. And you will always have trolls. Trolls are a part of the online environment. It's a very young environment, the online world. There is a, an amazing book on this topic, which you guys might want to consider reading, called So You Have Been Publicly Shamed by John Roms about, the, about trolls and the rest. It's useful in talking about the repercussions of how you respond to these types of attacks. Now, if you've been hired by somebody to do this, you're definitely going to want to consider you know, the simplest thing first. The simplest thing is, is this person a competitor or are they a disgruntled customer? Surprisingly, some of the easiest ways to deal with these types of things is to just approach the person and say, hey, what the hell is it that I did wrong in your product or service? Did my help desk support follow up in a way that was not effective to you? In other words, try to, that actually happened to me at one point early on in my online career, is I found out that it was just one single thing that had annoyed this person who was already generally annoyed with life. But I was able to actually get the thing retracted. There was something I, he was actually, you know, you, you'll find that most people are not pissed off for the reason they think. So if you're able to find out what it is, uh, you, sometimes you can get that retracted. Then you start escalating. If that doesn't work and it's just a flamer and he's just pissed off and he's bored, and he's got a lot of time on his hands, just a troll, then you've got to figure out what you want to do from there. You can take it to the next level. And those levels then include the things that Jimmy discussed. And reputation management is another one. And in really big corporate environments, when this is a real problem, they you get an attorney involved for libel and these, these other types of things. But generally speaking, I would go to the, the obvious things first, which is fanatical customer support. And you know, if your CEO or the person who is being flamed is the type of person who can't take that, I mean, if they're a good public speaker and the rest, sometimes they're just like, okay, here's the incident. Here's what happened. I've reached out to this person and I don't really understand what it's about, but you know, this is my position on it and then forget about it. So there's like, there's a few different ways besides just blowing somebody up that you can use to, to help your brand. And a lot of the times, again, this is a disgruntled customer. And if you take the Amazon approach to cust you know, fanatical customer support, follow up with it. A lot of the times you can just get that removed. Does that make sense? Theo, does that give you some ideas between the three of us that you can do? Or you cool. can go and back research what he does for an occupation and put his company out of business. <laughs> it's, you know, it's very, you know, I must say that I'm, the book uh, that John wrote called, you know, You Have Been Publicly Shamed scared the living crap out of me. Uh, I just recently finished listening to it on Audible. It might be something you guys want to, I, I would recommend listening to it. If you think that this type of thing, like, uh, trolling or flaming cannot completely destroy somebody's life, like then you you know read that book and and find out how wrong you are. There's dozens of cases 
over the last five years in which this kind of bantering back and forth on the social environments has completely lost people their jobs, their livelihoods, destroyed authors. It's much bigger than I thought. And so that being said, it's given me a bit of a new approach to thinking carefully about how I, how I deal with libel and how we deal with you know this type of environment. The best thing to do is just to keep your integrity high and follow up with the individual, you know, again, and see how that's happening. Now, that being said, on YouTube, it's very easy to get comp to get content that is harassing or uh, pornographic or just really nasty stuff removed. I mean, they're quite eat they're especially copied or stolen material. The three strikes. Well, you guys know there's a three strikes rule for swiped content for a YouTube channel. So if you find somebody consistently stealing your content or just swiping the video, all you have to do is toss an email over to YouTube staff and they'll look at it and they'll give that person one strike. So if there's any automated channel theft using things like video swiper or the rest, all these technologies, not that I would ever use those technologies. <clears throat> if you're ever doing that, then those channels are mostly automated. So three strikes, anybody stealing that stuff from you, you can just get those channels turned off. That's a slightly different tact, but it's useful to know that how easy it is to, to shut down some of the bots that might you know, be stealing your, your channel material. All right, so question two. Um, I'm building a DAS stack for my money keyword on my blog. Can I use the same DAS stack to link out my Amazon product, which has the same long tail keyword for the product, i.e. a third or fourth web 2.0 page that make completely separate cluster and keep Amazon money site separate? You know, if it's the same type of relation, I would just put it in there right there with your with your money site, you know. It's just a different money platform, so. I would just utilize the same stack that you have, but remember, don't go back in and put links into existing content. That's not a good thing to do. So, but from here on out, just know you can do both at the same time if you want. Can you clarify that, Jimmy, for any beginners? What do you mean don't put uh, links into content? Any content, or can you specify? I think that's important. Well, any content. So let's say that this box here was my content that right. I did. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to go I don't want to go and edit a link in here all of a sudden to go out to my Amazon site. So you mean if this was a blog post from any is there a limit is there a time limit to that like how many weeks or probably once it's indexed I don't touch it. Got it. Okay, so index as soon as it's indexed you shouldn't touch it. Yeah, yeah I, very cool. Yeah. Okay. So and it just goes, you know, especially with like PBNs and things like that. I mean, yeah. then they know that you're controlling the property. So um, gotcha. I just wouldn't, I wouldn't mess with it. I just create a new page and do a new link. So. Hmm. Mama, uh, Mama Doe is asking, so it will not leave footprint if those web 2.0s are linking to the same site? Well, in this instance, he's linking to his money site already. And then he is just asking if he also can link to his Amazon product mm -hmm. listing. So in that case, um, I wouldn't worry about it. I mean, it's just one in the same, basically. It's, I would say that's common. So Got it. Okay. I, I wouldn't worry about it in that sense. Good, good. As far as the footprint goes. Okay. Because they're going to two separate places. One is your money site and the other mm -hmm. one is your Amazon URL. So. Got it. Okay, excellent. Uh, number 21 from Don. How do I get the RSS feed for my YouTube channel? Oh, that's what. Uh, do you want to show them how to find that, Russ? I think I sent everybody the link earlier. Oh. And okay. I'm happy to drop it again. Um, yes, it's we've we've given you a, a couple of different time uh, kinds of. Yeah, I've already look on the chat, the public chat, Don, and I've given you a link to. The theme doom glossary is called RSS feed quick sheets, and I've given you a couple different options for YouTube RSS. Uh, okay, Don, let me just give it to you privately. Uh, anybody else not see that? Hmm. Okay, that's all right. I got the entire. Let me just give it to you individually, Don. Yeah, no worries. Probably hiding from you. Okay. There you go. Most of them. All right. Let's see. So, Paula, hi. I have an exact match from in that ranks in position 3 with no backlinks. One page of content and nothing else. Yay, it has been sitting there since 
last fall while I've tried to figure out how to rank an exact match domain without blowing it up. I have worked on another exact match domain that I never intend to use for anything as an experiment. It is not in a niche I would go anywhere near, so I thought it would make a great online lab. It doesn't show up in Google at all. Both domains were new domains, so I know I, I have done something wrong with the lab. Can you please clarify guidelines on what not to do and what to do with the internal optimization so as to avoid getting the site buried? The other site is one I really want to rank well, so I'm a bit concerned about blowing that one up. This is simply an issue with over-optimization on-site, I believe, since I have no external links to either site. No social profiles set up yet, etc. So you definitely want to be careful you know, and again, the traffic hospital is going to be, you, you want to get <laughs> yeah. to meat and potatoes. That's what you want to go look, you know, if you want to learn this in detail. But, you know, you don't want to repeat the same keyword over and over. So typically with EMDs, um, just because it is what it is, uh, Google knows what it's about. And then on top of it, until you establish a brand presence, it's very dangerous to start sending links to it. So a brand presence usually happens when, you know, it starts getting social engagement uh, going to the site. You've established some social profiles to it. Um, it might have some kind of business presence, so you might have citations or something like that going to it. Um, might be in Google Places. It kind of depends on the site, right? So, and, and if it's a actual business or, you know, just keyword oriented. So those things always help uh, before I start doing any kind of other type of anchor text. That's what I try to establish first. Um, trying to think what else you do. You know, not repeating the same keyword over and over. So if your site's about a particular keyword for the exact match, then you don't want to keep talking about the same thing. You want to be careful of putting the keyword in your tags, in your categories. Um, you know, Google, if you just look at your site as a whole, it's taking a snapshot. Um, you know, and it, it can determine, you know, if you keep writing about the same subject over and over again, whether it's through tags or whatever, um, Google doesn't like that. Plus, with the EMD update that happened, I don't know how long ago that was, two years ago, two and a half years ago. Um, you know, unless that EMD was was branded, it, a lot of those got hit. So they just distrust them, I think, right out the gate, uh, especially for big keywords. So branding is most crucial for that to start out before you start doing anything else, as well as your on-page optimization. So you want to go very, very light on those types of sites. Uh, let's see, another one from Paula, looking to rank a few sites for keywords for a service that the main entity offers was the best way to rank multiple websites, not web 2.0s for the same entry. Should they avoid duplicating the contact information, be stealth, not linked to one another, or is it okay to open, to be open to Google that they are all related? Or will Google punish for having multiple sites in the open <clears throat> in the open that all are related to the same niche and same main entity? Do these just automatically become PBNs because we have to hide relationships among websites from Google or get penalized? So typically what I like to do, you know, if you can bring up multiple sites, then some of my really good PBNs, how I would set those up back in the day was actually position them as money sites. So if anything ever happened to the money site or whatever, one of those could jump in place, but you're just going to have to treat them all as separate sites, make sure that IP and contact and DNS and all that's squared away, and you're just going to have to rank them all together as if they're all different sites, but they can certainly all go after the same keyword if you want them to. So, but definitely relationship uh, it's not going to be good. I also want to do different contact information, so making sure that you're varying up your name, address, and phone number because we want those to be unique in Google's eyes. 
um, otherwise, you know, they can they can identify groups of websites just from a phone number or something. So if they're all going to the same, you know, local phone number on each site, then that certainly can can point the arrows in a direction you don't want it to go. So, um, excellent. So that should be good on that, I think. Indeed. So this one's from Josh. I started to build a desk cluster, but somewhere along the way I missed basic Weebly knowledge. Should Weebly properties be treated like a PBN, or does Jimmy refer to them in the context of a money site, if as a PBN? Use best practices to keep ownership information private. Um, be treated like a PBN. I mean, I think all backlinks should be treated like a PBN, basically. I mean, you don't want to be connecting the dots on on any type of contact info that you have. Um, I always try to use unique accounts and emails and profiles with all of my stuff. Uh, some of them you don't have to worry about so much, but you know, certainly if you use a Gmail address for one of them, you don't want to use it on your Weebly. Uh, I believe isn't Weebly one of the hub partners? Yes. Yeah. So. Or I'm sorry, it's not a hub partner. It's a site. It's now a site partner. Yeah. So. A little, a little bit different, but it's a similar relationship. So Along basically, they're, they're probably sharing information between the two, you know, between Google and Weebly. So you know, just be cautious with yeah. emails and everything that you're using to register. Don't don't. Yeah draw a big red arrow to your money. Center. In fact, let me drop a link for everybody here uh, about the official hosting companies recommended now by Google. They're, as you guys know, they've moved into the domo do domain selling market and the hosting market, and they've got a big list of the sites, Wix and Weebly being two of the big ones that they are getting a little bit uh, intimate, if you know what I mean with. So I'll go ahead and drop that link here as Jimmy moves forward with this. All right, this one's from Nicholas. It is rather frustrating to be asking this question. I asked a question on last week's webinar about wanting to put up an SEO city site and asking about an appropriate silo structure when I am targeting an English city and a foreign. Well, um, currently live and where I remember answering this last week. <laughs> Or whether I should just do two domains instead. You kindly answered my question. Jimmy put in a link into the chat box for free research. Unfortunately, I did not mm. receive it since we had storms here and the internet connection went down, and I only heard the answer on the re replay. Could you please let me have the link again? Mm. I don't remember what link you gave him. Um, that was just the the href language thing. Oh, gosh. I, I do remember that. Again. Yeah, actually, I... Stuck that somewhere. The heck did I do with that? Let me see if I can find it as well. That was kind of major, actually. It can <laughs> be very helpful. Yeah. <laughs> what so I I'll put it. I'll put it in here again, so you can read up on that. And uh, you know, you can have both on your you site. Put it in the answers column. Is it not in the answers column? Uh, well, on oh, the you want it on the spreadsheet. Okay. Yeah, then it it'll go and be part of the webinar. Okay, probably a good idea. What the heck? The spreadsheet. You have to outsmart the spreadsheet. I know. Apparently, something I'm not doing. Smart sheets are tough. There we go. <laughs> Just use the keyboard. <laughs> Dang it. You make me push a button. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this one is from Eric. So, you know, hopefully from last week. So that link I gave you should let you utilize both. So you don't have to silo two different sites out or anything like that. Um, you could rank with the same page with different languages if you want. All over the world, you just got to do a little research in in uh, that link that I just put in there. Cool, awesome. So number twenty six is from Eric. 
Hey friends, I have a local niche lead gen site targeting dentists. The site also has one Facebook biz page and one Twitter account. The site focuses on one big city and three suburbs. The site is siloed as a home page on the top tier, then location cities next tier. Then each city has its own services underneath it. My question is, when following the DASTAC methodology, I am setting up a Hootsuite to point, as you should know in your chart, to both Facebook and Twitter, but these social props point to the main site. Should I be pointing the Facebook and Twitter to each city silo by ensuring a particular cluster Weebly blog slash all points slash lead to a particular post in Facebook and Twitter, which itself points to a particular city silo? All advice is appreciated. Um, you could do either one. I mean, I, you know, with your main pages, just link them up to your home page as done, as is. And then you also want to make sure that, you know, in, in your DAS cluster, I usually just try to link over to the individual uh, tweet URL or or the share URL or whatever you're trying to do. And those are the ones I do when I go directly to a particular portion on the site. So, but any of those would be fine uh, for that question. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> Don't know. Sometimes my brain dies here. So. It does to me. Um, another one from Eric. Hey, guys, I'd love to know more about something Jimmy said at the end of one of the last office hours he had. He said he didn't use PBNs to rank his sites and use other techniques. There may have been a wah-ha-ha involved, too. <laughs> I would love to know more about that. Could you please offer some insights on these techniques? Um, I don't want to discuss those techniques on the web or on this webby. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much... I mean, because it's just, it gets into a lot of other stuff, so it's not something you can, like, really hint out without people wanting to burn themselves to the ground. Yeah, and again... We don't we, implement it right. Yeah, and we'll default to what we normally say. I know that everybody on the call can appreciate the wide, diverse group of people that we have here, uh, so we need to be careful. Our, our default is to not expose things or have you do things that are going to blow yourself up or harm your business in any way. So. Okay, here's number from Andres. When you create a big website of 500 pages or so with vSilo, I believe the same as vKraken, it will just contain videos but no other content. Won't Google, it, Google penalize us for this, or do we go back and add content to the page later? So this is where you know, we recommend not doing it on a money site, right? So you don't necessarily want some of those auto-generated pages directly on the money site, only because you could be in a niche where you have a particular SEO person that just wants to report you. So, and he would be successful in doing so on a money site. However, anything that's going for backlink pages and things like that, it's not going to make any difference. So. I would just be sure that you're going to, you won't get penalized for this. I mean, you know, I think we've said this on some of the webinars. If you have a complete garbage content on the site, but somebody sits there and watches a video on the topic for five, five minutes on that page, is it still considered spam? You know, and I, you know, really depends on the value that you're giving to that content. You know, I would say that it wouldn't be considered spam if somebody's still willing to sit there and watch a video for five minutes on that page. So, yeah, engagements again. That comes back to the engagement rank conversation we had at the beginning of the call. And that's why we recommend people doing social explosion and things like that with with some of these other um, some of the other software that we have. So I would can you... also say that V Silo and Sorry, vSilo and vKraken are two different plugins, and we do show how you can use vSilo on your money site, especially if you have a domain and you want to like you want to start the ranking process. You can use vSilo to get it started, and then go back in and replace your content. Oh so, wow! I didn't even catch that. 
Oh yeah, he thinks they're the same. My mistake, Sue. I didn't see that you confused them here. Uh, everybody, uh, Andre's video. Do you feel like you just covered that, Sue? Well, I don't know. You can go into more detail. I've got all this construction here, so I keep muting myself. So oh yeah, I got you. Yeah. I got you. We got stuff happening in the office. Okay. Um, sorry, I didn't catch this. Andre V Silo and V Kraken are two very, very different technologies. Uh, Video Kraken has, at least in its current version, allows you to publish videos automatically, and pretty much, at least on the current version, pretty much unlimited. Video Silo can be used for money sites and does not publish uh, automatically after it's been published one time, either from Domain Web Studio or any Silo builder or uh, Kraken, Kraken Blueprint Generator. So we have a couple different technologies that will publish directly to your Silo plugin. Uh, Video Kraken and Video Silo are not the same thing. This is for autoblogging, specifically video autoblogging. It's the only kind of autoblogging we recommend. And we avoid the word autoblogging because it implies many things. It's only engagement rank blogging, okay, or uh, video blogging. Video Silo is a one-time pop, like whatever you've prepared in Domain Web Studio, or the Kraken Blueprint technology. Once you publish, it's going to pull videos that from YouTube, uh, and they're not going to be necessarily your YouTube videos unless you put your channel in and you've got all the keywords covered. And then what some people do is they go through over time or fairly quickly and get their own videos in. So hopefully, I just wanted to clarify for everybody watching, some of you knew these are two very different technologies. Okay. Do we want to give them that chart? Which one do you mean? Um, the one that shows the differences between the different silo plugins. Sure. Do we? What, what do we do with that? Out? Well, what do we do with that? Did we already finish that? All the contents on there, yeah. But, but I don't know if anybody's proofread it. Can you tell me uh, which one you mean? Is that one, the one you recently created? Yeah, I'll drop it to you in Skype, and you can okay. take a look, and then we can decide. Okay. Yeah. So we can move past that one. That's a confusion I want to help everybody understand. This is video Kraken is very, very big guns. And I want to make sure that everybody, there's, there's a reason we have a whole level three certification on this training for the video Kraken, because you can generate lots and lots of traffic with that, but you really need to have your silo site and everything done before you get into that. Or it's better if you do at least. All right, cool. So next one is, can you increase page authority by sharing content on social media or my blog feed that's not unique? Yes. Is so going to pass juice just the same as as not? So juice is juice. You take it in one cup and you pour it in the other, it's it's still going to pass that, that some of that juice. So the only thing we caution against is just over utilizing, you know, don't make your whole link profile based around only non unique content is what you want to be uh, paying attention to. So how many posts do I need or how many posts do I need to post a month and what duration slash frequency should I select in social explosion to see my domain authority increase ten through twenty five within ninety days? Um you know, how fast was that one, Sue? It was pretty, I and mean, we'd gotten it to a 13, I think, in f four days. It wasn't, wasn't hardly any time at all. Yeah, it was fast. We're doing some documentation on that and stuff, too. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, just as an aside, just a quick pause, Jimmy. Uh, I am going to go ahead and drop. We don't have a fancy schmancy spreadsheet uh, finished yet, or I'm sorry, a price comparison chart finished yet, but um, we're all family here, so I'm going to pass out the the spreadsheet version of what we're about to launch. This actually shows all of our plugins that we have, all of our, at least our um, silo plugins and how they work, including the one that's not yet released, but it gives you a sneak peek, and that should clarify any weird confusions out there about our different silo plugins. 
Let's go ahead and I'll put that in the other area. Thanks, Sue, for getting us that uh, excellent comparison chart. Sure. Should we stick it in the? Uh, yeah, I'll put it in the, the doc as well. Great. Ne next to Andres or? Yeah. I'll just get rid of video cracking because there you go. So it's read only, but you guys can visit what's going on. Do keep in mind that we are in the middle of awesome stuff, and I know we're very, very close to actually simple being released. It's funny how the way that Sue develops with the team is like everything all of a sudden explodes at once. So we're like on the verge with many of these things simultaneously. So we're looking, yes. you know, we're like literally like days, hours, days coming down. So simple, simple and Vcracken are out. Yeah, we haven't really formally launched them. So I just need to get that formally launched out to everybody. That's not my problem. <laughs> well, actually, it is. <laughs> it's, no, it's the other two. It's the deep silo and video silo are the ones that aren't ready to go out yet, but the other two are out. Oh, deep silo. Okay, simple. Yeah, we haven't uh, done any major launching uh, for a simple and video cracking. So we'll, you'll be hearing more about that over the next several days. Okay. Uh, All right. Next question is when you write a blogger post for a DAS cluster, can you do it from any old G plus account or should you create a new one every time? Um, I don't know. It, as long as your old G plus account isn't really connected to anything within what you're building, then I'll use it. Well, I don't mind using it. Um, but other times, you know, I like to kind of group my accounts together. So I know relate them to niches and, personalities and things like that so nowadays usually I'm doing a new one just because I want to keep track of everything as you do it but I don't see any problem with using an older one if it's uh, not connected to any of the other uh, PBNs or any kind of identification that would track that back to your money site okay nice um, 32 RSS slash tracking metrics, a while back you advised that you were working on a way to monitor how effective RSS feeds are, i.e. so that one can see the impact RSS is having. Is this available or still work in development? Yes, it is a, I believe he's speaking about the feature on the one feed supercharger that will allow UTM code tracking. Uh, that would be a question that C would have to answer. I'm not sure of the development date. A sec, let me read it. Um... Oh, yeah, that's still, um, so the UTM codes are there, and we just need to get the reporting module out to you. That's, that's um, mostly done, actually. Yay, let's launch everything. I didn't even know that was done. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. I think somebody might be. I think somebody might be muted, or Hello? else I'm muted, or else the universe just imploded. One of those three. I wouldn't be surprised by either one of those three. Okay. Let's see. I have more questions if we run out on this sheet, Jimmy. Do you have more questions? <laughs> no, I, well, not me personally. Well, yeah, I've got an infinite number of questions, but uh, they're not all appropriate <laughs> for this webinar. Okay, so um, shall we? Oh, we have one more to do here. Yes. Sure. Um, Nicholas. Oh, who's adding questions? Is that Sue? Sue is adding. Um, I think anybody can go in there, put them in there. Oh, on the spreadsheet? Yeah, I think they could do it in real time. No, that's all Sue Bell. No, they can't. They can't add it to. The no, they can't do it in real time. <laughs> it's me. I'm pulling. That would be I'm, mayhem. I'm pulling the, the question box. And then we would see all the we would see all the furry <laughs> animals at the top if there were other people like we do on this on the spreadsheet. Okay. Yes. Can you please explain a little what you have called persuasion architecture? Sure. Let me pull up my handy dandy. Uh, themes in wiki glossary, which I know that you all just love because it's so simple and uh, not academic at all. I'm just kidding. Uh, let me just see if I can find that. 
Persuasion architecture is what we talk about uh, when we're talking about how you set up your website to drive conversion. Does that make sense? We call that website persuasion architecture. Now, what we mean by that is, actually, let me just tell you the, the story of the term. The, the, the term came up because as we developed certification level one, tech foundation level one, that's one of our first level of advanced training that we have. Um, Jimmy, can you change the screen over to me for a second? Or, or can I change it for a second? You can grab it. OK. I'm grabbing. Oh, I'm not allowed to. You should have it now. Oh, did you give it to me? Oh, I'm sorry, you do. Yeah, I gave it to you. OK. We'll make it super quick. And then you should snatch it right back before I do something stupid. OK, so this is what we mean by website uh, persuasion architecture. We're simply talking about here's your technical stuff that Brainiac engineers and technologists like Sue and Jimmy know how to do that closely resembles magic to me. And then there's all of us here marketers over here on this side that's like, buy this over here, click this button. And if you order now in the next three minutes, we'll give you a bonus or something, right? In other words, internet marketing. Q countdown timer. <laughs> countdown <laughs> timers. Always put those countdown timers. <laughs> What's changed? Why now? Uh, you know, the, the interesting thing is that you really want this sweet spot. I know Venn diagrams sometimes seem oversimplified, but it really is helpful in understanding uh, what's going on there. So this is what we really mean, is the best possible SEO ranking and the highest possible conversion. And there really is a, a tension, a, a dynamic tension between your persuasion architecture and your silo architecture. So for instance, what good are rankings if people aren't buying stuff or opting in, right? And what good are, you know, in other words, if you, if you don't, if you can't utilize those rankings, then, you know, what's the point? I mean, there's a cost to, to get to getting your rankings. Does that make sense? Give me one if you guys understand that. What I'm saying now, if that makes sense. Okay, I'll go ahead and drop this uh, definition of persuasion architecture. Now, in our certification level one courses, we focus really a lot on that. This is this is stuff that's really kind of beyond what we brought to the table with OMG, just simply because it's complex. I mean, we're, we're teaching you a couple t transparencies at once. You know, we have to, it takes about eight weeks for us to walk through the precise implementation of, of how those things work well together. Okay, Jimmy, I'll pass that back to you. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Octavio says, guys, I sent a question before the web and for some reason got lost. Here it goes, stuck on page two for about three months now. What would be the first few things you guys would check? I would look at any type of inbound anchor text that you may have overdid in conjunction with the optimization of the pages that they are pointing to and see if maybe you've possibly overdone combining those two together is typically what you're looking at when you're stuck on top of page two. My guess is you're sitting at 10 through, you're probably sitting at number 12 or 13 for a while for those three months. He's asking you, Jimmy, do I delete the PBN or should I disavow the link from Webmaster Tools? Well, you can always just do a disavow if you want. Um, I would try the disavow first before I'd go and delete it because uh, I'd rather it change to, you know, there's no proof of evidence but other than rankings coming back. I believe that the disavow changes the link to be a no-fault link is why rankings come back once you do the disavow process. So I'd rather have that versus no juice at all being there. You know, that that's if you were to delete the PBN, so. Okay. Yeah, so I would just look at that. Just take a look, you know, go look at the backlinks going into that site and the anchors that you used and look at the pages that uh, they're pointing to 
and you know, check your densities, see if you've overdone your densities, or maybe you're talking about that keyword too much on-site, um, and that's those that's usually your culprit when you're stuck there on page two. Cool. So, 35, where's the best training for the latest version of Social Explosion? I'm having a few questions to get through. Okay. I know that we're in the middle of recreating the help file on that. See, when I talked a little bit about that before certification, the latest training um, would probably be the social explosion help file. So is that still the one that you want me to drop as the main social explosion help file? She's probably got some big loud machines on that side of things. I'll go ahead, uh, <laughs> Patrick, I'll go ahead and drop the current Helpful. I do want you to know, you guys, to know a couple of things. We have awesome upgrades coming, and this and that, um, and we also are going to revamp our help filing system for that. But I'm going to go ahead and drop you the the giant out of control wiki help file for now, and we'll keep you updated. Also, Patrick, please be sure that you've joined the social explosion uh, Skype room, and also feel free to use our fanatical support desk, which we've been also ramping up due to increased customer use. So I'll go ahead and leave those there, the current help file in its current location for you. <laughs> Somebody just gave our help desk a compliment. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, you said it took about four days to get to 13. Do you remember the amount of posts? posted in the frequency duration, you know, just even getting to 13 was just taking all of our major social profiles and linking them all up together. And that's all it took. All brand new accounts across the board. So that's all you have to do to get to a 13 right off the bat. So we're talking like YouTube, Google+, Facebook, Twitter. And then you know, places on those properties that you can put your money site into, and then also in your money site linking to those properties. That's all you had to do to get to that 13. So let's see. Remember, you know, the this metric is caused by, this is measured by Moz. So, you know, unless you're running a campaign specifically for it, if it's not ranking in the top whatever for keywords that it's tracking, it might take you might not see the metrics change. So we usually put the, for our testing stuff, we'll put these into it to just kind of measure it, uh, just to help it, just to speed along the metric for them so we can use it to measure. So on 37 from Chad, hi, I had a older site that was page three for a target term and sold social exposure and let it run on low settings starting last week. Over the weekend, the rankings dropped to page 10. I didn't do anything else to the site. Is it possible that the older content via social explosion hurt the site? I wouldn't think so on that. Um, let me see. Last week, last week you're going to be wanting to go look at your mobile, your site's Mobile getting <laughs> mobile getting stuff. So you want to see if your site's mobile compliant. So it wouldn't have been social explosion. I know that there's. You want to look anywhere between. I've seen them between the 28th and the third, for fluctuations in rankings, and most of them are just you know seeing if they're mobile compliant. And there's different variations of that from what I've been seeing so far. Like it could be mobile compliant, but your text size could be too small on the mobile compliant side, so you get a ding for that. So they drop you a little bit, but if it's completely not mobile, then it, those ones took quite a dive. So this one's from Paul. Um, if using Twitter to point different links to one's money site, does each link act as a unique link and provide additional power or trust or both? Uh, yes. So you're going to get trust and power from any of those links going to the different money sites because they're considered different URLs. 
going to different URLs. So, is it okay to create new social accounts for subdomains of a brand site that are focused on one single topic, or would Google punish that? I think if, um, like, I wouldn't want to cause brand confusion would be the only thing that I would be cautious of. I usually only do new social accounts if it's like a separate, uh, like, niche in the industry. So, for instance, like, when I do insurance, you know, my, my insurance site, there's car insurance and life insurance and home insurance. And so, you know, sometimes I'll break out different social accounts for each parts, you know, each different niche of that specifically because that way you get more uh, targeted audience for each of those specific niches. But, you know, if it's a real established site and you're not varying too far off topic, then I usually don't like to put that, I don't like to create that confusion with the brand out there. So, um, 40 from Don, Jimmy keeps saying stuck on page two or three, but if you are in a competitive niche, say car insurance, school IRA, you could be fighting against high DA slash PA trust flow. Your comments for average competition, yes or no? Um, yeah, I mean, if you have, if you're going up against high competition, you could take a while on page two, but you should still be able to get movement even if it's two or three places at a time. So you shouldn't be stuck there indefinitely. But usually if I see something go through and I know uh, some of my link build, building methods will push a site and I've, I've done that a few times and I'm not seeing any movement and it's stuck, then I know there's something wrong with the site. It's usually just a filter penalty though. So. And average competition, I usually just take a glance at like the front page and see what kind of TA I'm working with. And then how much link building are they actually doing to those pages and how big is their site? You know, for instance, an Amazon page, they could have one product that's related to that niche and you're dealing with a 98 DA or whatever for your competition. But I know that I could overtake that if I just build a really niche specific site, add more thematic relevant content onto there. I know I could overtake that. Uh, Amazon page because they don't have enough content related to that specific keyword. So there's ways around it. Um, so I just look at DA and then how much link building. Out of those ones, once I look at what my competitors are, I just see how much link building they've actually done for that particular keyword that I'm trying to go after. So And the quality of those links, right? Because you don't need Back in the day, it was a matter of sheer power. You know, whoever built the most links won. Nowadays, it's like <laughs> you can roll in with like eight links and do just as well as a site that's done like 2,200 links. So it's just a matter about building it smarter. Um, so I think that's it. I don't see, unless there's any other questions rolling in. That's good. It looks like we covered most of everything. And we've done it in about an hour and 45 minutes. Yeah. So that's good. Okay. So um, there are a few of you who are asking about other products. Just want to let you guys know that um, there's been two questions today on other products that we don't know about and how our products interact with them. Hopefully you understand that we don't, we're not going to be able to support third-party products we don't build uh, most of our items with third-party products in mind, so we didn't. We haven't skipped you. I've tried to answer you on the individual task, because it usually means that I don't know if it works with that product, and I don't know what that product is. Okay, so there's that. And that, is there any closing questions that you might have? This is your last shot. Go ahead and give it a couple more minutes as we close. And that being said, I want to thank each and every one of you for being at this event, and the replay will be available inside the Director's Cut area, Project B area. Okay. Oh, the social explosion group. Yes. Uh, by the way, I would like to close this by saying, uh, Skip, you've just asked me, uh, can you guys contact me on Skype? Here's the way that it works. We have a Skype room for most of our most important products. 
including our live certification events, but also social explosion. We have a director's cut Project B uh, hybrid room where we like to, we act, it acts as a halfway integration system between some of our software and and the director's cut community. Just contact me at theme zoom and you can, and I'll put, I'll toss you in that room immediately. Uh, my, let me just go ahead and type in the group area, my Skype address. Uh, so you don't misspell it, just look me up and please do let me know. I get literally dozens of requests per day for Skype editions and I don't really add anyone unless they say, hey, I'm from Director's Cut or hey, I'm from ThemeZoom or whatever it is. So it's just spelled T-H-E-M-E-Z-O-O-M. That's my Skype handler. Okay. With that being said, uh, I pro we probably should wrap this up. Uh, let me see. Yeah, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. There's a couple of other questions. We're going to go ahead and put these on for next week. Pip, I see your question here. And we'll go ahead and add these on for next week. With that being said. Um, Actually, uh -huh. mm -hmm. any, any questions that we didn't get to, if you guys would go and stick them in the, uh, in the oh. area, it would be good because it's hard for me that. to keep track past a yeah. point. Good. Let me drop that so we don't have to go. Uh, Sue's got an immense awesome. amount of programming stuff happening, uh, among many other things. So let me just give you the OMG dot software. Whoops. Okay, never mind. Let's leave that offline for a moment. Um, I'm actually having a server issue. Yeah, that one's going to be offline for a moment, unfortunately. Oh. Yeah, we're we're down. It's a long story. It'll be up in a minute. I'll tell you what I do. You guys should really contact me. I can see some of you are already started contacting me. We're having a server issue that'll be up shortly with that. And then inside the director's cut, I'll leave the area where you can add your questions. So just copy and paste your questions that you may have put into our little window here, put them on a notepad on your desktop. And just as soon as I get the web form back up, uh, you can go ahead and drop it in there. And then we'll start collecting all these questions for next week. Now, those of you who are new, we have our questions in the evenings that we rotate I believe next Tuesday, we'll have it at our evening time. And we'll also provide you with the information on that link as well. Thank you so much. And this has been Russell Wright, uh, Sue Bell, and Jimmy Kelly for the Director's Cut, OMG, and Project B uh, community. Look really very much forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.